Hello and welcome to the session on data processing agreements under the GDPR. My name is Kwan Hon and I'm director in Field Fisher's Privacy, Security and Information Law Team in London. Today I'm joined by Georgina Lawrence, a senior associate in the same team. This session is the second part of module two of our Get Data Protection Fit program. The plan was to provide videos to cover different levels from the fundamentals to applying data protection law in practice. Module one and part one of this second module are available on the Field Fisher Privacy, Security and Information Law YouTube channel. Module 2A has already been covered, and in this session, we are going to look at what needs to be included in a data processing agreement. Thanks, Kwam. So this session and learning outcomes. By the end of the session, you should be better able to explain what a data processing agreement is and explain what must be included in a data processing agreement. So to recap from the previous session on controllers and processes, what is a controller? Well, a controller determines the purposes and means of processing the personal data, the why and the how. A processor processes personal data on behalf of the controller, so they have to follow the controller's instructions. A subprocessor is appointed by a processor and they must follow the processor's instructions. Note that a processor can become a controller if they exceed the controller's instructions or they process the personal data for their own purpose. So what is a processor's role? Well, the controller must instruct the processor on what personal data it can use and for what purposes. A processor's obligations must be specified in writing, sometimes referred to as Article 28 terms, a DPA, or data processing agreement. So in short, the controller tells the processor what to do. So when a controller uses a processor, it must carry out prior due diligence. We'll deal with this in a future session. They must put in place a GDPR compliant DPA that we're talking about in this session. And throughout the relationship, they must continue to carry out ongoing checks on the processor, the use of their personal data, and to check they're complying with their instructions. So what is the data processing agreement anyway? Well, the GDPR does require that there has to be a contract or other legal act between controllers and processors. And this obligation is on both controllers and processors, not just on the controller. So processors also have an obligation to have a compliant data processing agreement in place with its controller. The controller, of course, has to make sure that they only use processes that provide sufficient guarantees to implement appropriate measures so that the processing by the processor will comply with the GDPR. This is the due diligence phase mentioned earlier on. And there have to be data processing agreements, not only between controllers and processors, but between process and their sub-processors, sub-processors and sub-sub-processors, etc. And Article 28 of the GDPR does list what needs to be contained in a data processing agreement. Now, does a DPA have to be in the form of a separate agreement? No, not necessarily. These Article 28 required terms could be an appendix, an addendum, part of the agreement, a separate agreement, etc. It is quite permissible to have 
additional commercial terms between the parties, as long as the terms of these other agreements don't actually undermine the required Article 28 terms. So what has to be in a data processing agreement exactly under Article 28? Well, these have to contain the subject matter and duration of the processing, the nature and purpose of the processing, the type of personal data, categories of data subjects, and obligations and rights of the controller. So it'll be common to have perhaps a schedule or an appendix which will explain the relationship of the parties, uh, what is happening, what the processor is being engaged for, and in terms of types of personal data and data subjects, it'll be things like uh, names, addresses, um, images, medical records, etc. And data subjects could be employees, customers, website users, and so on. It is also common to say that the controller must comply with its own obligations under the GDPR. DPA must state that the processor can only act on the written instructions from the controller unless otherwise required by your member state law. This is, of course, the essence of being a processor. You have to follow the instructions of your controller. This includes in relation to international transfers to third countries outside of the EEA or international organizations. We've already covered transfers in a previous session. And uh, this is quite an interesting point. The only area where the processor can be fined, the higher tier, 4%, 20 million euro fine, is actually in relation to international transfers, apart from disobeying regulatory orders or not cooperating with the supervisory authorities. But in relation to transfers, as well as anything else, the processor is supposed to act in accordance with the controller's instructions. And it's not uncommon to say that the controller must authorizes, or perhaps in other cases, it'll say the processor is allowed to do this as long as it is complying with the GDPR in relation to adequate countries and the like. Thanks, Kwam. So we move now on to Article 28.3b. This requires that confidentiality obligations are in place for the persons authorised to process personal data. So that means that the agreement should include a provision which requires the processor to ensure that the person, persons it authorises to process the personal data in line with the agreement are subject to a strict duty of confidentiality and that they can only process the data in accordance with the permitted purpose, which should be set out in the agreement. The processor should also ensure that those who are processing the data receive adequate training. So this includes not just the processor's employees, but individual subcontractors, consultants or others who would be involved in processing the personal data for the processor. Some parties may require that the agreement sets out named individuals and standard confidentiality undertakings. The wording should also make it clear that the processor cannot permit anyone who is not under this duty of confidentiality to process the data. Moving on to Article 28.3c. This requires that the processor complies with security of processing as outlined in Article 32. Article 32 states that the processor should implement appropriate technical and organisational measures to protect the data from accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration and unauthorised disclosure of or access to the data. Such measures should take into account the cost of implementation, the nature, scope and purpose of processing the data and the risk of likelihood and severity for the rights and freedoms of individuals. So certain measures can be specified within the DPA such as whether pseudonymization and encryption of personal data is required, the ability to ensure the ongoing confidentiality of the data, 
ability to restore the availability and access to personal data, and a process for regular testing of these measures. It means that processes need a comprehensive understanding of their own systems and the type of data they process, for example, is it sensitive, whether or not they engage sub-processes, and they must implement the necessary measures to ensure data integrity and security. Moving on to Article 28.3d. This requires the processor to comply with Articles 28.2 and 28.4, which relate to the appointment of sub-processors. 28.2 states that the processor cannot engage another processor without the controller's permission, and they must inform the controller of any intended changes to give the controller the opportunity to object. Many DPAs are written where the processor has the ability to name a subprocessor and the controller has the right to object, but the controller can only object for a justifiable legal reason. GDPR does not require a reason to be given to the processor. So it's common in DPAs to pre-authorise a list of subprocessors, and it's also common for a right to terminate to be included in case the controller is not happy with the subprocessor. Article 28.4 states that where a processor engages another processor, then the original processor must ensure that the same data protection obligations are imposed on the second processor and done so within a written contract or other legal act. Now, in reality, it's often almost impossible to impose the same terms on the processor. So in reality, these should be no less protective terms the initial processor will remain fully liable to the controller for the performance of data protection obligations by the other processors. So that's why it's vital that the processor puts in place subprocessing terms with any subprocessor. Another requirement under Article 28 is that the processor has to assist the controller in terms of the controller's compliance with its own obligations to respect data subject rights when data subjects try to exercise those rights. But this is qualified because it takes into account the nature of the processing and the processor is supposed to assist the controller by appropriate technical and organisational measures. Similarly, the processor is required to assist the controller with the controller's own GDPR obligations in relation to security, notification of data breaches, and data protection impact assessments, including any prior consultation with the supervisory authorities. And again, this is taking into account the nature of processing and the information available to the processor. Now, processors have a statutory obligation to notify the controllers of personal data breaches without undue delay in any event, but some DPAs might try to impose a specific time limit, require the processor to provide information to the controller so the controller can fulfil its own notification obligations, take action to remedy or mitigate the breach and inform the controller of the developments and so on. DPAs must also contain a term requiring the processor to delete or return all the relevant personal data to the controller once the service has been terminated, unless storage, continued storage by the processor, is required by EU or member state law. Moving on to Article 28.3H. This requires that the processor must make available to the controller all information necessary to demonstrate compliance with its Article 28 obligations and submit to controller audits and inspections. Now, depending on the bargaining power of the parties, this may be a difficult clause to agree within the agreement. For example, should the audits take place on site or off site? What information or facilities will be made available to the controller or third party auditors who are conducting such an audit? How often can an audit take place? Does a controller need to provide a certain period of notice before conducting an audit? There's lots of questions that need answered when drafting this clause. 
Some processes try to get round the on-site audits by suggesting that they can provide written reports or show compliance with certain industry standards. Moving on to other Article 28 provisions that often aren't dealt with directly within a DPA. So Article 28.5 says that adherence of a processor to an approved code of conduct or approved certification mechanism may demonstrate sufficient guarantees as referred to in Articles 28.1 and 4. Article 28.6, contract or legal act may be in whole or part, based on standard contractual clauses. Note that these are not the same as those used for international transfers. The European Data Protection Board has provided two opinions on standard contractual clauses so far for Denmark and Slovenia, and Denmark has issued its final version, which the ICO has said is OK. Article 28.7 states that the Commission may adopt standard contractual clauses for Articles 28.3 and 4, and 28.8 states that a supervisory authority may adopt standard contractual clauses for Article 28.3 and 4. So a question that often comes up when trying to negotiate the terms of a data processing agreement is costs. Who pays for what? There are a number of obligations and requirements within the DPA terms, such as where one party has to cooperate with another, where a controller is allowed to carry out audits on a processor, where a processor needs to assist a controller with subject access requests or a data protection impact assessment. This is likely to incur cost, so who should cover this? This may or may not be dealt with within the terms of a DPA, and often you'll see that a controller will agree to pay the reasonable costs of a processor for assistance with these obligations. Now, there are other terms you might see in a DPA. For example, some DPAs contain a term saying that the processor has to notify the controller immediately if, in the processor's opinion, the controller instructions violate the GDPR or indeed any other EU or member state law. Now, I've actually traced through the history of that provision. It is a mistake. Uh, look at my article on IAPP. This is actually meant to be a statutory obligation. It's not meant to be something that's in a contract. But if it's in the DPA, then the processor might in turn want a term saying the controller is not going to give any instructions that might violate the GDPR or other laws. And furthermore, that the processor is effectively not required to have any opinions because otherwise this is the processor having to give free legal advice to the controller. Another term that you might see in data processing agreements is a requirement for the processor to maintain data processing rec records. It has to do this anyway under the GDPR, but this is a contractual obligation. It is not a requirement on Article 28, but regulators think it's good practice. It doesn't matter whether the Article 28 terms are contained in the controller's standard terms or the processor's standard terms. And indeed, with services like cloud, it is quite common that it's going to be the cloud provider's standard terms, which will contain the Article 28 requirements. And it's quite hard to apply Article 28 to cloud unless you take certain approaches, which is what the major cloud providers have done. So instructions are meaningless with a cloud service because it's self-service. So the instructions are whatever's in the agreement and whatever the customer does with the service. In terms of security, it's impossible for cloud providers to comply with every single customer's slightly different security policies. So it's the cloud provider's own security policies and they may offer security certifications and the like to customers. As regards conditions for engaging another processor, the direction of travel is different, as I put it, because it's not like traditional outsourcing where you go 
and you find a processor which then goes and finds a subprocessor and so on to perform a particular tailored service. Cloud is the other way. So it's already been pre-built by the cloud provider using its own subprocessors. So therefore, the conditions for engaging another processor have to be complied with slightly differently, including pre-authorization by the customer of the cloud providers existing subprocessors, notice of change of processes and a right for the customer to terminate. As regards assisting the controller with data subject rights, etc. Well, again, organizational technical and organizational measures have been provided by the cloud provider to allow self service access to the data that is hosted in the cloud. And of course, this is insofar as possible taking into account the nature of the processing. So it's quite common for services like these to recite insofar as possible, taking into account the native processing because that qualification helps them. And they may also provide for the costs if anything more is required to be paid by the customer. And similarly, with assistance on security, breach notification, etc., it'll be common to ensure the qualification about the nature of processing and the information available to the processor is included in the terms. And again, cloud providers will offer certifications, make sure they only have to notify actual rather than suspected incidents because there's tons of attacks all the time on cloud services and then provide for the cost. Who pays the cost of the information on breaches, providing assistance, etc. And it's common for not necessarily cloud providers, but some service providers to produce their own DPIA, which the customer can then use in working on their own DPIA, the customer's DPIA, that is, when the customer is required to do so. As well, deleting or returning personal data. Again, this is self-service. The customer can download their own data, and it can be quite expensive for the cloud provider to be forced to actually return the data downloaded for the customer. So again, they might well provide for costs for that. And of course, there is a lot of data which may be kept in archives or backups, so it won't be possible to delete everything immediately. And it'd be common to say, well, this will be deleted in the next deletion run, but it can't be immediately deleted. Making available information, Georgine has already talked about audits and the like, but obviously for commoditized, standardized services like cloud, um, it is with data centers, which are obviously very important for all customers, it could actually be riskier to allow all and sundry to descend on data centers and audit them. So uh, there will often be restrictions, offering certifications, third party certifications and audits instead. In practice with the cloud, it's probably more important to audit the software than physical audits of data centers. Moving on to liability under the GDPR. The question that often comes up when negotiating a DPA is how will you apportion liability between the controller and the processor? Do you put in place indemnities? Controllers and processors may be exposed to direct claims from data subjects, claims from each other, and regulatory action. Processors may face claims from controllers who breach a contract, but processors will only be liable for the damage caused by the processing where they have not complied with a GDPR obligation specifically directed at processors, or where they have not acted in accordance with the instructions of the controller. In terms of practical tips, it's important to set out the responsibilities of both parties clearly, should a dispute arise. And if you're a processor, make sure you keep records and evidence of compliance with obligations to the controller under the contract and your GDPR obligations generally. Thanks very much, Georgina. So we have now explained what a data processing agreement is and what must be included in a data processing agreement. That brings us to the end of the session of Module 2A of Field Fisher's Get Data Protection Fit program, putting data protection into practice. And here are our contact details should you wish to get in touch with us in relation to any of the issues in this session. Thank you very much for listening.